Here we go. So here we are in the basics of knowledge organization for personal knowledge or management. Um, this is kind of the overall agenda. Um, so I'll give you the introduction. I'll talk about who I am and my gave her data shirt. Um, and then I'll talk about what this is and who, who you are and hopefully what you can learn from this. Um, then we'll do a little bit of a history tour through the entire history of Western civilization under 30 seconds. And then we'll talk about cats and logs and not chaining your books. And then I will recommend that you rob a library and museum blind. And then we'll talk about tags and hashtags and thoughts. So if that's not intriguing enough, let's start with what I, who I am. I'm Bree. Um, I'm a settler, um, non-binary, queer, and disabled per person living in Stable Tooth, as I mentioned. I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia Information School. Um, I study equitable cataloging from galleries, libraries, and CAMs, archives, and special collections. That's that GLAMS abbreviation there. Um, before this, I had a, I got a library degree at University of, um, University of Indiana Bloomington, and I focused on digital humanities and metadata and organization of knowledge there. Before that, I did the history of the book and history of sexuality, and I published a book on the history of pornography, and it's just on Conan O'Brien, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but I still need a job, and I still went back to grad school, and so brings us to the present day. I am going to kind of um, just kind of give an, I thought maybe the best way of doing this was to start by saying what this presentation isn't. Um, it isn't the, the final and ultimate solution to all of your problems with organizations and file. It isn't the end all be all answer to how to organize personal information management or how to do not organize your knowledge bases. Um, it will offer the perfect solution for your specific case, um, but you can pay me to do that. And if you would like to thank me for today, please donate to a local um, sex worker organization um, if you are able to. Um, what this presentation is, is like I said, a rapid fire history of organization and galleries, libraries, archives, museums, special collections, why they're like that, what we can learn from it. Um, and then I'm going to give some broad concepts that you can adapt to your own system and the tools to think creatively about how to organize your own files, um, your own knowledge work, your own mission, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish with um, Obsidian or any other personal knowledge organization. Some of this presentation is based on a post I made in the Obsidian forum, um, God, in December, um, cataloging classification information science, PKMs and you. If you would like that, the link's right there. That, that is probably a, um, a rougher version and um, not as well thought out, but it is still, a, I think, a pretty good introduction to some of the things I'm talking about here. If, for example, um, you need, if, um, if you do not have access to image descriptions, because I won't, I won't be going through and describing all the images, but all the images in that are described. So I'm gonna take a sip of water. A very brief and very Western-centric history of knowledge organization begins in ancient Mesopotamia with tablets stacked on edge side by side. Um, these contents had like a little tile up front right on the side of the tablet to describe what the book was about or the tablet was about in that case. If you jump a few thousand, 2,000 years ahead in the future, um, you get scrolls and you're in ancient Greece at this time and Rome and the Library of Alexandria. This was kind of the standard classification system for libraries in the ancient world. Very common in the Library of Alexandria, for example, and very common in the Roman world. These scrolls would have tags um, on them, or they would have an additional scroll that like prefaced all the work. And these scrolls would list um, what the, the internal contents of the book or the scroll was about. I know it's the world, <laughs> saying the world scrolls a lot. Um, but the scrolls would list uh, the author's, author's name, who their father was, because that was a very important um, thing for understanding what the, what the book would be about or what the work would be about. Biography of the author, a country, other works. Think of it as like the ancient Greek version of uh, Wikipedia, except literally patriarchal. <laughs> um, and of course, then you have the quote unquote fall of Rome and the quote unquote dark ages, which weren't very dark, but in terms of knowledge organization, perhaps you could argue they were um, because libraries were just, they were organized haphazardly. So were mu museums weren't really a concept, um, special collections were the only kind of collections. Oops, somebody is unmuted. Oh, there we go. 
Um, and this is a quote from a library historian. He said that libraries were organized according to the whims and knowledge of whoever was in charge. Very often that was the, the priest or the father or the reverend or the bishop or the pope, whoever was in charge. Um, and by the way, there's, there's a longstanding rumor that the, the Vatican Library has the world's largest collection of pornography and it is not true. They have actually none, very, very little, what we would, might even call that. Um, the world's largest is actually in Indiana in, in, in Kinsey Institute. But anyways, that brings us um, up to right past the printing press. And even, even eight years after the printing press was introduced, there were, um, gosh, I guess intellectuals complaining that there was now too much to read. There's too much to know. Not everybody can't read everything that's left in the world now. And this is eight years after. So like, people were struggling with um, how to organize information very, very quickly after the printing press enabled this wave of information. It, it kind of is a, is a struggle for, for about 200 years. It, there is um, Gabriel Noday's advice for establishing a library. Um, he splits it into seven categories, um, theology, medicine, jurist, law, history, philosophy, mathematics, and humanities. Not, not, not a bad system, I think, but it's really only meant for um, nobility who were, had the money to collect books. And um, his system was designed to make the books look very pretty on the shelves. So anybody that has ever organized your library by color, there is actually good standing in library history to do so. Uh, about the turn of um, the 1900s, you start seeing the really big national systems come into effect. And this is because they, it's actually reached a crisis point at, the point, at this point. Um, you'll notice that all of these really start in the United States and that's because the United States had a lot of money and was investing a lot of money in um, library organization. After 1812, um, when the British invaded, well, I guess the Americans invaded the British first and the British came over from Canada and burned, burned down um, Washington DC. It burned down the entire Library of Congress at the time, um, who they went on to purchase Thomas Jefferson's library. So they they were investing it at the, at the, for the very first time was the biggest investment the federal government had ever taken was buying Thomas Jefferson's library. So it all ar arrives in Washington. There's not really a system to sort it. So they um, start using Jefferson's system, which is kind of based on nowadays, um, but it's not, it's not really a great system. So about 1850, um, Dewey, Des Dewey, uh, Neville Dewey, as in Dewey Decimo, comes along and is a terrible person. Um, his, his system is still used in a lot of public libraries today, more than moving away from it. Um, it is currently run by a corporation called OCLC, and there has been, they've done quite a bit of work in trying to improve the system. Um, but very quickly, a lot of people start realizing that they need to develop better systems. Um, to two that come out of Dewey Decimal for academic libraries and like larger national libraries are the Cutter Expansive Classification, which becomes the Library of Congress classification, which is currently the widest and most popular library classification in the whole world. Um, I have lots of thoughts about that that I'm not going to right now, but it is it's based off of Cutter's Expansive Classification, which I will talk about a little bit later, um, a little bit later on. I think that's a really good starting classification if you're looking for something like that. Finally, um, the best, I, I think the best and the most fascinating for sure is the universal decimal classification system that was invented by Paul Outlet and Henry Lafontaine. Um, it's an analytico synthetic faceted classification. And all that means is that with a string of numbers, you can query a database and say, I want books about firefighters who are white in Sweden, but only from the years 1923 to 1940. And that, that's what that string of numbers allows. And I can, I'd be happy to talk more about that, um, but it's, I think, beyond any, like what any of us will be able to accomplish in our own little systems. So that, that was the whole history of library systems. So with that, let's talk about the difference between cataloging and classification. The simplest version of this is that classification is where things go and cataloging is what we call them. Um, if you want to think about this in terms of library, um, if you've been to a public library uh, or an academic library, you will, so if you've asked a librarian and have asked a librarian for where a book is, you'll know, you'll notice probably that they'll say, 
okay, is they'll close their eyes and they'll think and they'll be like, okay, it's on the second floor down three shelves to the right. And the reason they can do that is, is partially it's playing into the memory palace effect where they can create this palace of books in their minds, but it's because of the classification. Classification builds off of that ability that humans have to remember where things were placed. If you've read through a physical book and you were trying to remember a particular quote, you can usually remember where on the page or like roughly where in the book it was. That, that's what classification is really systematizing. Um, and for libraries and museums, archives, all of these, it, it's basically where we, where we put this thing on the shelf when it comes back or when it goes out and if it gets lost, where it probably is. And if you want to think about that in terms of your own system, these are folders. These are really folders and how you organize folders, how you sort them, why you have them or why you don't. And um, a good folder structure system is just as good as a really good library system because you can, you can visualize where in this tree of folders that you have um, the note that you're looking for, or the project or the PDF that you're looking for. Cataloging is, is what we call these things. Um, so these are probably if you're using data view or if you're using um, some of the plugins that allow you to like tag or, or even if you're just thinking of linking different ideas together. Th these are what you title your notes. These are how, how you organize your, your notes internally. It's not necessarily reflected on the outside. It's what's inside of the note, what the note is made up of. So cataloging, where things go, I'm um, sorry, cataloging what we call them, classification, where things go. The reason I get into that so much, um, and I'm not going to dive too deeply into all of these, is up on top here, you have the three major kinds of classifications. You know, universal schemes like Dewey, Library of Congress classification, um, and universal decimal. Universal systems want to describe everything in the world, and they think they can. And it's um, useful if, if, you, if you have that kind of money and that kind of system. Um, it's not so useful if you're looking to organize your own notes or your own or your own system. Specific classification schemes, um, and, and there's national schemas too. And I'm not, I'm not really going to dive into that one. That's really um, the Library of Sweden has their own national scheme, but or um, the Kinsey Institute in Indiana, for example, has a, a special classification system for its books. But specific classification systems are really what we're concerned about here. And these are the bigger organizations, of course, um, British Catalog Museum, National Library of Medicine, Dickinson Classification. These are, these are huge institutions, but um, special classification schemes are what um, we are interested in and, and what um, your notes or your system reflects about you, really. Um, and of those three, uh, of a specific classification system, there are three different types of cataloging systems. And this is, I think, what will help a lot of people who are looking to organize um, the actual notes within their um, Obsidian folder, within um, their Dendron folder or Logstack folder. You can either order things in a enumerative way in which you can go A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four. Um, you can order things in a hierarchical way. And you might do this using data view, and I'll show you an example of that later on. Or you can organize them into, again, a faceted analytical synthetic way. That is probably much more what some of the more advanced data view um, templates and data view um, examples are doing. This would be, for example, um, sorting on, um, I'm thinking of one of the data views that was just like list of books somebody had read. And you could sort on, for example, the year the book was published. And also you want, um, books by a certain author, or if you have a quote database, you can sort by the person who said the quote along with what year they said it. Those are the facets, and you are you're like trying to think through. That's the analytical part, and the synthetic is the blending of that. So you're blending the fields you know that exist, your own thoughts, and your own the way it's structured in order to create that sort of data view tablet. And this one then is, is beyond me. I, I still have a lot to learn about data view. And I'll, I'll show you an example of a note later on where I, I think I'm slowly moving towards data view, but I haven't um, really gotten a chance to get there. So um, just a summary. What can we learn from all of this? I think the first thing we can learn is nothing is perfect. There is, there, there's no perfect system. And as much as I wish there were, because I love organizing things, there's not. Um, Maybe if you haven't used hierarchy ever, 
try it just just like a little bit just as a treat just to see just to see if it helps you and um and th that's always to say don't do something that's not going to work for you if you try it and nothing's working for you don't do it just just discontinue on if you have a one big folder full of notes do that and that that's better and perhaps you your system is better structured internally with um tags and with other organization systems but no matter what you do, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't. I, I've seen um, some people who come into the Discord or in the forums um, looking to reinvent an entire system of classification from the ground up, and it's, it's admirable. And it sometimes results in really interesting things. But um, ultimately, this it's a lot of work, a lot of stress, and a lot of um, time wasted because the, the library systems have been doing this for, for centuries, and there's so much you can just learn from them or just plain rip, rip them off, reduce, reuse, recycle, just base it, base things on what have happened. Um, this last thing there is tags, which I, I don't know, I have, I, I'm, I, I use tags in the sense of like status updates, um, but a little bit later on, I'll just, and I'll probably the last slide, I'll talk about um, how I use tags and ways I think that we could think collectively as a community about using tags and emojis particularly. Finally, uh, this is the moving into like the, the last third of this presentation. Go change your books. This is a, a picture from the North Region Library, I think, in the United Kingdom. And this was pretty common. Um, books were chained to the shelves uh, up until, gosh, probably past. Queen Elizabeth's time, past Shakespeare's time, probably like, and I think still in some libraries, there are books that are still chained to the shelves. And it's, it's, so you can't, so you can't go steal them. Um, and this is kind of like a way of saying here, I'm trying to say, don't limit your system, try to experiment. So if, if you came here, look today, and you're looking for just like a really simple, sim simple system that you can take away and implement today, use this. It's the cutter classification system. It's free. It's available online. It's this is what the Library of Congress system eventually became. It's a really useful way of just, oh gosh, why don't we section three here? Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, ten, ten or twelve sections here. And that's a really useful way. You can you can probably summarize just about everything you have in your notes into these categories. I might um I might add a category for computer science because that wasn't really a concern in 1872. Um, I don't know if I would split up literature and fiction. I might combine the two, but but that play around with that sort of system if you're looking for something. On the flip side, if you're looking for the most advanced thing, go ahead. The Library of Congress system is out there. I please don't do this. It's 500,000 items, and they're all organized in a hierarchy that you could spend just 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 forever on. The one thing that you could do with the Library of Congress classroom system, if you were struggling to figure out a way to organize um, a particular folder, whether you not want it to be like the big folder or the little folder, you could go to the Library of Congress classroom system and you click into each one of these subject headings. I'll have an example a little bit later on, and they will tell you how they have organized it in their system. Um, reduce, reuse, recycle. Here is a picture from my own um, file system. And on the left, you can see here, I'm in this folder. So this, where's that little laser pointer? Cool. So here is like my um, Obsidian folder. And this is my class and UBC stuff. So that's just straight Johnny Decimal, nothing fancy. And here is my Obsidian folder again, and this is my Etc. section, and this is like society, philosophy, religion, and I'm using cutter system here. Um, here's the reference. Here's productivity, philosophy, historical sciences, society, language, and literature. So the, the one that we just saw here, pretty much basing it right on right off of this. Um, and folders allow you to do that. Folders allow you to have different structures within different folders. You don't have to have the same structure all the way down. You can be like. No, this one particular folder, I'm going to do this other system because it's a much better fit for what I'm doing here. Um, and like I said, here, here is an example of the Library of Congress um, subject headings. And here they classified pets. And this is a guide to how to read this. So the broader folder for pets would be domestic animals. 
and uh, a related term or folder would be um, household animals. Um, see also not used as much, but could, you could use cats and dogs and a narrower term would be like a cocker spaniel or African bulldogs or so on. Um, and this might be how you structure your notes as I've done it here. Um, it might be a way of you structuring your folders. Um, it might be a way of you tagging things, it might be a way of you relating things. Um, one of my dream plugins would be that somebody could like tie in the Library of Congress subject headings and I could just like, you could just like reference that, let's link to that automatically and just apply that to all your notes, uh, get real close to linked data and it'd be very cool. Um, and what I've done here is in, in my own um, folder, I have a folder that's the 500s. I think I can just, here it is. Yeah, so with my 500 folder here, I just have these, this sort of thing. So these are all um, the notes I've made on top of my Zotero items. So these are the individual notes that I'm building up on top of that. So I have a fo uh, folder here that's qualitative research method. And I'm thinking that it might be best to return this into data view. Um, I still haven't figured that out yet. So if anybody wants to help me, that would be awesome. Um, tags. Uh, yeah, I, I was very conflicted about tags because for a very long time in library science, they kind of thought tags would be the solution, the answer for everything. They, um, there's a very long history of people being like, well, we can just have all of our readers tag things and that, that will be really useful. And it is, it, it tells us a lot of things about readers, but if you've ever looked through Goodreads and, or I don't know, any kind of tagging system and you've seen like 16 misspellings of the word philosophy, that also tells you what the, the downside of tags is that they're, they're not structured, they're not, um, they're not regular, they're not, they're not useful. And they're, they get really hard to remember when you start having more than a few of them. So I think it's much better to think in terms of linking notes because that you can have an authoritative note they can link to. Um, and in a library, these things are called access points. And an access point might be, if you were a user in a library, you might be searching for Dan O'Neill, your favorite author, or you might be searching for the Firecracker Boys, that book that somebody recommended to you. Or you might be looking about the history of the atomic bomb in Alaska any of those things that you enter into that search field is going to come up with those access points. Um, and this this right here is like one of those old school catalog cards, but any library system today you go to now is going to be structured like this. One of the things I kind of have here at the end is um, a way that we might think about using um, tags. And uh, you can see here, I've, I've taken Brian Jenks system more or less of, of using emojis as tags. But one of the things I realize um, very early on is that of course emojis have meanings they're not just um they're not just like meaningless things that you in order to have an emoji you have to like write up a whole proposal and send it to unicode and you're going to accept it and if you start digging into it they they have some really interesting meanings and the the, the emojis mean very different things um so for example uh this first section here i have non-research notes um and i'm basing it off like this pink color uh and the, the, the highest form of the non-research known is the Hanamaru, which is the O mark, or basically how you get like a 100% um, in, on your paper in Japan. Um, and that's kind of a way of thinking of like red, green, red, red, yellow, green. It's a way of thinking of like I'm building on this first initial tulip to Sakura to a high, high stylized plot, 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 blah, 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 blossom. And this is the other, the other group um, of um, note that I have here, which are research notes, and I'm going off the yellow, um, the yellow coating on the emojis. So a flower, a sunflower, um, and then a rosette, meaning like the a very high end military decoration. So another, again, like another award, like you've reached your evergreen note status. So I don't, I don't know, it could be an interesting way of thinking through how we might rethink tags um, as data view and other things start really replacing them, I think. That's all I have. Um, and my goal was really to present everything up front and then to take some time to answer questions. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and I will, um, I think I'm going to have to stop recording that way people can.